So genius, what does that come to mind? What if, when you think of a genius and when people call you a genius, what do you think about? Well, it, it makes something do this inside of me because in reality there's no such thing as genius. Genius is not a permanent quality. Um, genius is other people's perception of you. Um, genius is something I've been stuck with trying to achieve all my life because there was no other, no other role left to me. Kids wouldn't allow me into any normal role in life. And my role model when I was 10 and discovered that I was already senile at the age of 10 was Albert Einstein, who was also prematurely senile all of his life. He couldn't remember to put his pants on in the morning and his shirt before going off to um, the, the Center for Advanced Studies at Princeton University. He would schlep out of the house in his bedroom slippers and his pajamas. And his wife would have to come running up the street behind him, saying, Albert, Albert, you forgot something, and holding his clothes, his pants, his shoes, his shirt in her hands. So that, that was a guy I could identify with. I was equally absent-minded. So that left me with an obligation to try to be whatever it was that Albert Einstein was, which is impossible. I'll never be able to achieve that. None of us will ever be able to achieve that because we have to achieve our own thing, whatever it happens to be. And um, so I've been stuck trying to achieve genius ever since I was a kid. And, but in reality, genius is a floating point. Um, Genius is not a permanent quality. You know, you can have a nose and your nose will change over the course of time, but you'll have that nose for the rest of your life. It's a permanent fixture. Genius is not like your nose. Um, genius is trying so damned hard every single day that it defies belief. Genius is something you have to prove every, every hour over and over and over and over again. And it's not a matter of proving it because what you're, what is a genius? A genius is a person who gives us a dramatic new way of seeing things around us. Aristotle did that, well Plato did that, Aristotle did that, Copernicus did that, Galileo did that, a tiny handful of humans, and Einstein of course did that, gave us a very simple radical new view, world view, into which things fit in a whole new way. So that's the obligation of genius. So it's not just the obligation of genius to take this. This isn't even the amount of information. This is an indication of the amount of information. This is a reference to a pile of information that would actually fill this room if it were all printed out. That's the information I've been gathering and been trying to make sense of all my life. But ultimately what it comes down to is simplifying it to something so simple that you can put it in a paragraph, or sometimes you can put it in a simple slogan. And I've been mentioning some of those simple slogans in the conversations that we've been happening, having today. The fact that an atom is a social aggregation, that it's based on a communication between an electron and a proton, that from that communication and that social aggregation come properties that defy belief because that we have no names for them except for emergent properties. Um, they're they are the identity that emerges from a form of social organization that's in constant movement, like a wave across the sea, which is never the same set of atoms for more than a couple of seconds, constantly changing its constituents and yet retains an identity, undergoes changes as the winds change, uh, as the amount, as the temperatures change around us, around it, even undergoes a change as it begins to hit the shore and begins to rear up uh, and break. Um, but through all of that, it maintains an identity anyway. How the hell does it do it? How do you maintain an identity when three billion of your cells are dying and being replaced every single second? And when you're changing from an infant to a toddler to a child to a teenager to you now, and, and you're aging. And despite all of these radical changes, there is some identity which does have an identity, a solidity, a hard and fast reality of its own. And an atom has that too. Something more than just being a proton and a neutron or an electron. What are these emergent identities? Why do they have such profound reality? Why, in fact, does their reality have as much, not just as much to do with what the cosmos is all about and evolution and life? because evolution and life are some of the most dramatic aspects of the cosmos. 
what is, what are these identities? Why does a nation have an identity? Why does a civilization have an identity? Why does a belief system like Islam or Christianity or atheism have an identity, an emergent property? What do those emergent properties do for the cosmos, this 13.8 billion year old cosmos? They produce things that have never existed in the history of the cosmos before. When religion first arose among humans, no such thing had ever existed anywhere in this cosmos so far as we know. It was a radical upgrade in the nature of the forms that this cosmos and structures, or whatever we call these things, emergent properties, that this cosmos was able to produce. Thought, language, culture, all of these things were dramatic upgrades in the nature of the cosmos and its possibilities its range of available tools. Um, radical upgrades. And we're, you and I are contri either participating in or contributing to potential radical upgrades of this kind that the cosmos seems to enjoy, seems to be obsessed with, seems to make her very nature. Nature is change. Nature is not stasis. Nature is not equilibrium. Nature is creative, unbelievable, astonishing change. And vital to that change is the social identity that we can't even define because it's so much more than just the sum of its parts. Like the identity of the wave, like the identity of Geo Geller that persists through all kinds of amazing changes, like the identity of Howard Bloom, like the identity of the United States, or the identity of Western civilization, or the identity of Muslim civilization. These are all astonishments to be understood by science if science is to be what it really should aspire to be, which is, if there is no God, it is our job to do her work. If there is no God and there is no omniscient being, it's our job to aspire to that omniscience. And what if there is? And if there is, then God would be, she'd be very pleased with her aspiring to achieve being her because in the process we're reinventing her and that's what she enjoys more than anything else in this universe. Her? Yeah. Uh, that's we, arbitrary. Hmm. And the mere fact that we think of a god as a him or her is a little strange, um, since being a him or her as humans is a little strange. Could say that again. But it's these little strangenesses that science is supposed to be about understanding. So I'm trying to pose new problems to science, and I'm trying to, to give some of the terms, the vocabulary, for new ways of looking at things. And ultimately, I suppose I'll have to get it down to a paragraph or a simple slogan. New ways of seeing lead to new ways of being. That's one. Um, that's a bloomism. Um, but there's lots, lots more. Um, since there is no God, it is our job to do her work. God is not a being. God is an aspiration. God is a goal to seek. Ours is the job of turning um, pains and pleasures into understandings of turning even our uh, foulest dispositions into new ways of seeing things. And that's a summer, that's a paraphrase of something that's in the computer but in a slightly more poetic form. But um, I mean it's, it ends with um, this is the work of deity and deity resides in us. So because it's an aspiration you know, God is what we're shooting for. Um, it's not a being. But that's my personal belief system. You know, I'm an atheist. Um, and I believe that atheism imposes on us the obligation to seek omniscience, especially if science is but our atheism soul. atheism a, a religion as well? Yes, it's a belief system. Um, and it has its divisions. There's uh, militant atheism, which is what Richard Dawkins and his little group, Sam Harris and the boys, um, are into, that religion should be wiped off the face of the planet because it's, per it's created all the evil that has ever existed. That's a crazy idea. All the evil that has ever existed would have existed with or without religion because humans like chimpanzees are warlike creatures. Humans like bacteria are warlike creatures. And then there's my form of atheism, which is benevolent, tolerant, uh, pluralistic, and admires religion. And spiritual religion. You're spiritual. Well, spiritual, yeah, in the, some crazy way that I'm trying to articulate with a new vocabulary. 
because, as I said, even an atom, even an atom's identity is more in the realm of something you could call spirit than in the realm of material things. It's that shell that emerges from nothing, and then the properties of hydrogen and atomness that emerge from the nothingness, and that emerges from something about that social aggregation that is an emergent property bigger than the sum of its parts.